from working with him heavily to working with P. Diddy because he seems quite scary. Well, I always worked with. Uh, I'm not scared. Baby, baby, I mean, shit getting weird. Come on, baby. Cassie has sued music mogul Sean Diddy Combs, accusing him of filming Cassie in ritualistic, ritualistic blank apps. Back in the days when he was like 10 and I was a little bit older, his older brother, we used to fight over the, over the frosted flakes. I'm going to leave them with somebody to watch them. Not a babysitter. Um, I like to call, call it a den mother. The scared look in her eyes, the red light, the turning the angle of the camera. And the men would give gifts to each other and have with each other. Puff and Tupac was like a couple. If you think that she was just hiring those male pro for herself, nah. There was a party at Clyde Davis's house, and that's where the story began. Welcome to BJ Investigates, a show I just created and might never do again. So today we have the occasion to talk about yet another Lou Taylor client. That is going to be Sean Puff Daddy, P. Diddy, whatever other names he has, Combs. Also, I don't know if he still is Lou Taylor's client, but there is a plethora of information and evidence in the public record that he at least was at some time. Very powerful, very influential music mogul. Anyway, so you might have seen the news a few months ago whenever, oh, we're just going to call him Diddy for this video, whenever he was in the media for allegations that arose that he was not only involved with the blank plot to blank Tupac and Biggie, but also allegedly, at least according to this detective who was investigating into the case, he also orchestrated this plot. The Los Angeles Police Department feels that they have solved the murders of Tupac and Biggie. What? Wow. Yeah. After working on the cases for three years, Greg claims that Diddy was behind it all. Oh, oh. Diddy. Uh. Yeah, right. I don't know. There was a whole bunch of other videos and stuff going on around YouTube about it. I didn't really get into the story at that time. But then about a month after that happened, he was in the news yet again. And this time it was for a different type of set of allegations. This time it was allegations being brought forth by a singer named Cassie. Um, when I saw her and I met her and I saw this DVD on her, hopefully we could play that. That's what kind of made me like really fall in love with the project because I saw something more than just records. I saw something that there was a personality. In the lawsuit, they do refer to her as Miss Ventura. I started modeling when I was 12. I didn't get signed until I was 14, but I actually started working when I was 12 years old. So. Now I'm 20 and almost half my life I've spent in the entertainment industry. But yeah, so basically Diddy and Cassie had had a relationship for like a decade. Final question, is there anything that you may want to confess tonight before you go in? I keep everything right here. There you go. Or right here. <laughs> and I mean, I use the term relationship loosely. Because the way that she describes it in the lawsuit, and again, innocent until proven guilty and all of that. The way she describes it in the lawsuit is not particularly like a traditional relationship between a boyfriend and a girlfriend. It was a little bit more like a owner and um, what, you want my, what, what you gotta say now? What you gotta say now? Person who has owned. You ain't got shit to say when you put your girl on the snap. Baby, yo babe. I mean, shit getting weird. Come on, baby, it's hot outside. You fucking wrapped up in that blanket. Let's go jog on the beach. But we will get into a few of the specific lawsuit allegations in just a moment as we progress through the video. What I also wanted to point out in today's video is that this is not the first time that Diddy has been accused of these inappropriate types of behaviors. And I want to be very careful. Again, innocent or proven guilty. I am not making these allegations. I'm just collecting what's in the public record and reporting on it as of what I was able to find so far as of today. So I thought in today's video, we could go a little bit into some of the research that I I did find whenever I was looking up the similar allegations that have been made against him in the past. Now, for the purposes of the allegations made in the complaint by Cassie against Diddy, those have been, I guess, dismissed or withdrawn. They seem to have settled outside of court, so that lawsuit doesn't seem like it is going to move forward. So I hope everybody, you know, is pleased with that outcome and all of that. I definitely can see why Cassie wouldn't want to go to court. In those allegations, we get a lot of information and a lot of 
of the information that she does say kind of adds up to allegations that other people, famous people, celebrities, child stars, things like that have made in the past. And they were called crazy or whatever, you know, schizophrenic or whatever. You still think the Obamas are ugly? Yes. So I do want to just take a little bit of a look into the public record and show y'all some of the stuff that we were able to come up with concerning similarities in all these allegations. So in no particular order, there are allegations and assertions concerning a 10 year old usher sleeping in the same bed as a then approximately 40 or how old would he have been at the time? No, he was nine years old. That's my brother right here from day one. We used to wake up and I mean, damn, pause, but like, check this out. I mean, I mean, back in the days when he was like 10 and I was a little bit older, his older brother, we used to fight over the, over the frosted flakes, you know what I'm saying, before pause was invented, you know what I'm saying? But it's my brother for real. We used to actually wrestle off of the, off of the frosted flakes because he used to always get up early and now he's one of the richest stars in the world. And I'm Yo, like, what the f*** did Puff just say? They've said like different ages, like Usher himself has said in an interview, he was 10 years old when he started sleeping in the bed. And that's what I'm saying, like the math isn't particularly mathing on that. So I do just want to present all the sides of the story. Some places we see 10 years old. Yes, I got a chance to see some things. Yeah, but you were 13, what were you I seeing? I went there to see the lifestyle. Right. And, and I saw it and it was, <laughs> and it was, but I don't know if I could indulge and understand what I was even looking at. It was, it was pretty wild. You know, what like a, a life. Living. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. 14 years old. I think what we just calculated was closer to 15 or 16, which of course doesn't make it better in particular, but just wanted to be fair. Okay, so there, there was those allegations. Then recently-ish, like in the past few years, Orlando Brown, a former child star who was actually on a Disney show called That's So Raven. That's so Raven. Sing it again, do it again. No. No, do the song again. No, I don't want to, Raven. I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> Raven. <laughs> Most prominently in a few other, I mean, endeavors. He also is a musician, he's very talented, but he's made allegations that were vague, to say the least. I mean, you know what I mean? I got in my Diddy mode, I'm sorry, I start licking my lip. Let me see, you know what I mean? Question. Yo, Diddy, you gave me the Ooshkash Goosmash. You gave me the Ooshkash Muaf, the Smoosmash. Diddy, yeah, son, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? You gave me the Ooshkash Muaf, I love it, yo. I love it. You gave me the Ooshkosh Mouash. You can fill in the blank as to what that meant. <laughs> <laughs> that Ooshkosh Mouash. You know what I'm talking about, Diddy? Mmm. Mmm. Diddy. Mmm. God. Yeah, and now the whole time, all these allegations are kind of starting to swirl and twirl. We have Kevin Hart openly, very publicly making jokes about it. Thank you for hosting the thing, man, man. You, you, it's been a pleasure. You didn't have to do it, you did it. No, 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 I definitely didn't have to do it. I, I definitely didn't have to. Uh, first and foremost, I'm not getting the bed. Uh, you know, shout out to him and what he did. I'm just gonna, if we can, just let's, let's just put the camera a little this way, just so we're not, I don't want my shot to even, like, I don't want it to come close to the bed. Pointing it out, talking about it, laughing at it. And then, of course, we eventually stumbled upon these wild Hollywood parties that it's really impossible to escape learning about at this point. Like, it's kind of everywhere you turn and look are these parties. It's like, I don't know why it's such a topic and why it keeps coming up. Y'all, this is on some eyes wide shut. This is on some taken. This is on some mess that I have never seen. Diddy would use his phone laptop and tablet all devices that are streaming he didn't use a regular camera to film cassie having blank with the higher blank workers he treated the force encounter as a personal art project adjusting the candles he used for lighting to frame the videos he took the candles y'all if that don't sound ritualistic i don't know what is maybe they just have had so many at this point i really do not know it describes some ritualistic eyes wide shut mess the first time diddy hired a man and bought the man to his home in los angeles the man diddy and cassie wore masquerade masks and ingested illicit substances 
Diddy directed Cassie to perform blank acts on this man while Diddy watched them. That don't sound like an eyes wide shut weird ritual that is being live streamed. But we got people involved allegedly, according to public reporting. I was not there, I do not know. But allegedly we have uh, Jamie Foxx involved. I would hang out and watch him throw parties. He said, yo, Playboy, this party costs a million and a half dollars. Puff at that time had a room, Missy Elliott, had a room, dun, 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 you know what I'm saying? Dun, 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 dun. And standing on the wall, nobody knew who he was. Guess who it was? It was Jay Z. Oh. Standing on, they didn't know who he was yet. And I was like, I saw him, what's up? And he said, It's a nice party, man. Appreciate that. <laughs> We should give just a few clips here, just as a complete side tangent, a little comical relief, a little something, something like 50 Cent does not seem in any way to be a fan of P. Diddy. I don't call, no, I don't call, I don't call him gay. I said, let I me read it, let me read okay, it, read. Fifth. Oh my God. Sorry I can no longer Shades help confused. you guys. Soon you will all be gay and happy. You are all now left under leadership of Puffy Daddy. Report to the nearest rainbow, Dinner Thieves. In theaters, Jenny. Oh, that's <laughs> why I did that. I was like, I'm not gonna do it. You invited the pop party. I'll just ding, ding, ding. Here y'all go. Stop. Then he was like, yo. He was like, yo. So, yo, when we gonna get the chance to, you know, to kick it, like, we could just hang out? We gotta, we gotta kick that. it. This is Paul. Okay. You're telling me we gotta kick it and shit. And he was like, yo, why don't we, like, go shopping or some shit? I mean, like, I pay for it. And I was like, what the fuck this nigga just say? <laughs> <laughs> but, um. I got the fuck away from him. Because I was like, this is like, what the fuck is you wearing? Cute, funny. Well, this is your little fruit, my puppy's a fruit pile. <laughs> little beef, little funny. Like, the fruit pile, trust right. me. You see these little weird ass pictures and shit? Like, he's just letting them know. And he'll tell you too. He's like, don't tell me anything because I'm going to go and tell everyone. Don't tell me a secret. I'm telling. So good for him. Me too. Okay. Yeah. So there's all these secret parties going on. And then there's allegations that Will Smith and Diddy are actually like co hosting these parties. Jada Pinkett and Will Smith, you told me before that she was at a party before that they attended and you said the party was weird. Tell me about that. Okay, uh, it was just, uh, seemed like Puff and Tupac was like a couple, seemed like to me. Uh, it was just a lot of weird shit going on, you know what I'm saying? The vibes ain't there. I guess that, that's what Tupac was talking about, the little and shit. It ain't right. It's like Vivica Fox was with this big gay man. He was 6'9". Yeah. yeah, yeah. Weird, dude. Yeah. And what was Tupac doing at the party, yo? Him and Puff was there. Together, it was there, you know what I'm saying? That's why I don't know how they fell out or nothing like that. They was road dogs, you know what I'm saying? They ain't even got pictures of them. He got on that uh, uh, that blue sweater with the turtleneck. Him and him hugged up like this with the black hat. Have you ever seen that picture? Yeah, bunch of, uh, it ain't right, you know what I'm saying? No, I'm not no gay bastard or nothing. I mean, none of that shit, but that shit ain't right, you know what I'm saying? And then, Oh man, other people have come out and kind of discussed just, you know, there was just so much crazy stuff going on in that house. And apparently, I didn't know this. I don't know if this is true. I did not fact check this, but I did come across in the research today that Jaden Smith emancipated himself when he was 16 and he refused to go back to Will and Jada Smith's house, even for like family photos and family, you know, interviews and things. I don't know if that's true. I vaguely remember some shit like that. Jaden Smith wants to be emancipated from his famous parents, Will and Jada Smith so he can buy his own house and live alone. Comment below if you want a video on that. So we have the Will Smith allegations that he's also kind of like doing exactly what P. Diddy is doing. And it's interesting because a lot of people do go and openly talk about these parties and stuff. It's like, a, it's in the public knowledge. They're all talking about it, but it's almost like people still don't believe it somehow. I don't know, maybe it's just because there's this mythology and this sort of fear culture built up around it. Like you're gonna somehow get in trouble for talking about it, which I think is an intentional buildup, but. I digress. So in addition to these weird parties and all that, there was also this kind of like flavor camp component to the whole situation. Now that yeah. was L.A. Reid's idea, right? We're sending New you over York to City. something called Puffy Flavor Camp. There you go. To learn <laughs> flavor some- Camp. Yeah, flavor Camp. Yeah, that's what it was called. And you're gonna go to Puff Daddy's. He's gonna- In the 90s, do you understand what that's like? Puffy's place was like just filled with chicks and gene like nonstop, right? No, nah, not really. I come mean, on. but- did there, hey, So nobody tried to, you know, some woman didn't come along I didn't say that. Okay. I, I didn't but say that. And what flavor, it's like silly. Like the name is silly. What Flavor Camp is, if you've watched this channel for a while, you remember the Dan Schneider pool parties that he used to have. Dan would host these recruiting parties for children. He would have pool parties. 
and invite all the kids over and be like, oh, we'll just take care of the kids. No adults need to come over. So he was having pool parties with these kids that were on the show without any kind of adult supervision going on. One of my friends that used to work on a couple of the shows that he did, I mean, this goes back to the mid early 90s and he would spend extremely large amounts of time uh, along with the kids in their in their dressing rooms without any adult supervision in there either. He was just- Well, this was like a different flavor, pun intended, of that essentially it was like a boot camp where you learn how to be a star and in diddy's case it was like you know rap and r&b and hip-hop and stuff like that that's actually how usher had the occasion to be in the blank <clears throat> sleeping situation with diddy in the first place is that he was at the flavor camp he was like in his like star training boot camp when he was sleeping in the bed with diddy for a year he said he slept in the bed with him you're a dad now would you ever send your kid to puffy camp <laughs> hell no, no. <laughs> so usher was not the only person to ever attend and go through the flavor camp situation training or whatever justin bieber seems to have been at least doing a little bit of an abbreviated flavor camp where we hanging out and what we doing um we, we can't really disclose but um we've played this clip before on the channel when we did the justin bieber conservatorship video but it's just kind of like generally tense and strange just the whole interaction the whole concept even in and of itself i don't know I, i'm I, 16. No, 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 slow down let's slow down Justin. Okay. Let's slow down, okay? One step at a time. Who knows? Maybe I'm the one that's strange. Who knows? But another interesting thing about these flavor camp and these different camps and stuff is that P. Diddy was not the only person doing it. There were other people who were doing this type of thing. For example, Lou Pearlman. Now, if you're not familiar with who Lou Pearlman is, he's a very, very prolific boy band creator and manager. What he does is take teenage boys who might otherwise lead unremarkable lives and turn them into rich, famous pop music stars. And now fast forward, he has pled guilty to a host of crimes, including money laundering and I don't know, like misuse of wired something or another. He did pass away in 2016, but before all of that, he created a very popular show called Making the Band. Baby, I don't understand. I wish, wish for you on a fucking star. What's up? Hey, you Jackie? From Boston. Boston, huh? Yeah. How old are you? I'm 19. 19. <laughs> so we'd like you to do just a little bit of acapella for us. And the Rockets! That's high. <laughs> a rock star named Ashley Angel? How perfect is that? It's tearing up my heart when I'm with you. But when we're Now, Lou Pearlman was the manager for like Backstreet Boys and NSYNC, uh, LFO, O-Town, a bunch of other ones. He was very, very famous. And so a lot of people, boys at the time, wanted to be famous. And so they thought they would, it's like American Idol kind of for boy bands. And Lou Pearlman, the guy who created the Backstreet Boys and NSYNC was creating the show. So he does one season on the show. And then, I don't know, we couldn't really exactly find why he quit being on the show or whatever, but he only does one season. And he does that with O-Town. Like I said, he eventually would end up pleading guilty and going to prison for some stuff and dying. So season two, the show making the band is handed over to Diddy and he takes over. You might have seen episodes of the show with specifically the band Danity Kane. As y'all know, I'm not doing this alone. I have Johnny Wright. He's helped shape the careers of NSYNC, Justin Timberlake, Backstreet Boys, Britney Spears, myself. Laurie Ann Gibson, she has choreographed anybody and everybody, including myself. Doc Holliday, vocal coach to some of the best vocalists in the game. This is going to be a team effort of us molding and shaping this group. I need everyone to find a treadmill or a Stairmaster and do 20 minutes at 5.0 right now. You guys are playing with the wrong gal. But there were many, many seasons. These girls are standing out for all the wrong reasons. Michelle. And in total, all together, there were like 142 episodes of the show, including that first season one that Lou Pearlman was on. But anyway, so I just thought that was a very interesting connection there because Lou Pearlman ended up getting accused of some of the very same type of situation type of behaviors that now Diddy is being accused of by Cassie. And I'm not talking about the financial crimes type of accusations either. You know what I mean? 
So I did think we should discuss just a few points of the lawsuit that hopefully I'm staying within all the guidelines here. Unfortunately, I'm really not going to be able to get into all the specifics of all the allegations because quite frankly, is really heinous. But it is a publicly available document. If y'all want to read through it and look at some of Cassie's allegations, it is publicly available. I just typed in Cassie versus Diddy PDF. You'll be able to find it, at least as of today. So what I really want to focus on is stuff that maybe wasn't as heavily focused on in the media or stuff that I just didn't see. It could be the case that this stuff was very heavily focused on. Maybe I just didn't see it. So first of all, I think it's very important to note that she's suing him for blank trafficking, right? That was one of the things. Again, this lawsuit has settled, but the complaint is still available to see because it's a public record. And in the lawsuit, she actually does use the term, to the extent I'm able to say it here, blank slavery. She referred to her experience with him over that 10 years as slavery. Okay, so one thing that I found extremely interesting, and it kind of reminded me of Britney and Bam and other celebrities who have come out and made these types of allegations, where she did say, I think it's on page three, that she actually did try to get away. Because that's what a lot of people ask, like, 10 years, if this is going on, why did it go on for 10 years? Like, get away from him, obviously. You know, that's what people are saying. And she's saying, I tried. But every time she would escape, it says, quote, vast networks of entities would come after her and basically, I mean, gang stalk her. She basically described that if she would ever run away, either assistants or people who worked for Diddy in some way, even lawyers would call her and say, you need to call him back. It's in your best interest. She described being threatened, um, her career, right? Because at the time, Diddy was the owner of Cassie's record label. So really, I mean, he kind of owned her in in a business sense. And then also, you know, they had this additional type of dynamic situation going on as well. Other allegations in the lawsuit include Diddy being ferocious and cruel. And we did come across this clip of, I'll put it in here. Uh, It's an interview, someone talking about the story where Cassie did shave the side of her head one time. Everybody thought I had lost my mind. And (laughs) I remember saying the interview. She was telling him like, whatever daddy or Diddy or whatever she was calling him wants, that's what I'm gonna do. He saw this, this this white woman. It was bottles on bottles on bottles around her. It was lit. Puff jumped out. Me and Cassie sitting next to each other. My wife right here, Cassie right here. The nigga jumped off the bar, came over and said, yo, yo, Cassie, tomorrow, I want you to shave the side of your head. And I was like, I'm like, what kind of request is that? <laughs> like, so when I'm like, what the fuck? So when I look up there, this white woman side of her head was shaved, man. And it just looked good with it. So I was looking at Cassie, I was like, well, I, I was like, you're not about to do that, are you? She said, well, I mean, whatever Sean wants, I'm gonna do. So she shaved her head, even though she didn't want to. I'm not gonna read them all out here. This is where she kind of tells us why she's suing. Like, what? what's the point? Why are you doing this? She says she doesn't want to live in silence about what she endured. Mr. Combs remains immensely powerful and immensely dangerous. Cassie therefore seeks justice for the decade of her life that Mr. Combs took away from her with threats of violence, excessive use of blank, and physical and psychological abuse and blank you all slavery. So that's where she actually refers to it as a slavery type of situation. Paragraph 45, I thought this part was interesting too. This section of the video is called Stuff I Found Interesting. In early fall 2007, Mr. Combs, that's Diddy, flexed his power and influence when he paid a promoter to create a fake flyer for a party hosted by Cassie. It's like when you realize that people are just all just kind of faking and they're lying because someone told them to. It's very scary when those people are in charge of your captivity or whatever. So she also says in the lawsuit, all aspects of her life were controlled by either Mr. Combs or his management companies. And what came to my mind immediately was Lou Taylor tactics, because I don't think P. Diddy is like using Lou Taylor's management companies. I think he probably learned his methods either from her or from the same person, but I said there was a party at Clyde Davis's house and that's where the story began. It was reported place to place for a while that P. Diddy is or was one of Lou's clients. And so it's like this complaint says all aspects of her life were controlled by either Mr. Combs or his management companies who was giving Britney Spears those pills. TriStar, according to these lawsuits, I don't know, innocent until proven guilty or whatever. 
But the allegation is it was the security company, the management company, and people they would hire to effectuate the larger scheme or the larger plan. But it looks like this is the same thing happening here. She said her life is controlled by Mr. Combs or his management companies. Every event she attended, from the travel to the makeup and the clothing, was paid for directly by P. Diddy and his affiliated companies. Again, I'm not saying that Lou Taylor was involved in this in any way. I have no evidence of that, so I'm not saying that. Okay, paragraph 60. She talks about Diddy exerting ownership over her. Another example of the ways in which he manipulated her and ensured obedience early on in the relationship is that, oh, this is sick. He asked her what she called her grandfather, like what was her name for her grandfather, and she said, Pop Pop. The lawsuit's words, not mine. When Cassie said that she referred to her grandfather as Pop Pop, Mr. Combs perversely insisted that Cassie refer to him with that nickname. Something wrong with him. All right, what else? Something wrong with him. It ain't right. Okay, so one time he particularly aggressively abused her, even for him, and she was forced to stay in a hotel for a week. She could not leave. And that's when she started to really realize, started to dawn on her, page 14, what was really going on in this tremendous network that he had that would, you know, bring her to a hotel, lock her in a hotel, not let her leave, not let her parents come, not let her go to her parents and stuff like that. So one thing that was covered very extensively in reporting on this was these alleged freak offs. Diddy was using Cassie as a honeypot to lure other men. People were hired to come in and perform certain types of work with Cassie and Diddy would record the work and he would do so on several devices including iPads, computers, phones, etc. He used these videos allegedly according to the lawsuit to kind of blackmail her and say I always I'm going to always have the videos or whatever whatever, right? Well, one thing I didn't see highlighted, and again, could have been, I just didn't see it, is paragraph 79. Well, let's start at 78. The first time these freak offs happened, these FOs happened, Diddy had hired the man and brought him to his home in LA. They wore masquerade masks and ingested blank. Diddy directed Cassie to perform certain things with the man, and Diddy watched them as he blank in the corner and kind of directed the scene telling him what to do but then the next sentence the entire encounter lasted multiple days multiple days multiple days i didn't see that reported on anywhere could have could have been but on the third day they would drink party be merry and the men would have each other I just wanted to point it out here. Like it wasn't just one night or whatever. And she also went on to say later in the lawsuit that it was very often that she would end up having to get IV fluids or whatever after these apparently marathon FOs because she would be so dehydrated from the activities and the substances, et cetera. But I guess so if it lasted multiple days. And then she goes on the lawsuit to describe that she would start to get extreme and intense anxiety before these FOs. At one point, it was happening weekly. If she would say no, according to her allegations in the complaint, she would be beaten. Again, innocent until proven guilty. None of this stuff has been proven, and that's just the way it is. I personally am inclined to believe it's probably true, but I don't know. I was not there, so who knows? So as you might have heard, and as I've mentioned already in this video, um, it has settled. The parties have reached some type of agreement that is going to keep the case out of court. I used to say, you know, that's not right because we should all get to know what happened. Happen, but really, I mean, it's really a lot to put on somebody that if she really did go through that, I could totally understand why she wouldn't want to go to court over it. So I think I hope she's happy with her settlement and all of that. Just gave me other things to think about, other things to ponder about. I guess the best part of this whole story is that I got down the rabbit hole a little bit and it opened my eyes to a lot of other stuff that was going on that I didn't realize the connections before. But it's, I hope it's not true. It's really tragic. But like I said, I, I feel like it probably is true. And I understand why you would want to settle something like this instead of going to court with it but that's all i really have for today in the meantime facts ain't defamation love you mean it okay bye